I was sitting across from Coco as she proudly showed me pictures of her new home on her iPhone. It's not the house yet, but at least my kids have a room of their own. She stated while beaming proudly. I too was grinning from ear to ear. Her happiness of this accomplishment was infectious. We were in Jackson, Mississippi, my beloved hometown, where I lead an organization called Springboard to Opportunities that serves over 5,000 mostly single Black mothers annually with what we call our radically resident-driven approach. That's really a fancy way of saying we don't assume we know what people need or want, but instead we ask them and then we go about supporting them and getting it. On this unassuming day, I asked Coco, what is wealth to you? Without skipping a beat, she said, if something happened to me, my family would have the money needed to cover my burial expenses. It was an unexpected punch to my gut. I do not know why I was caught off guard in the almost decade that I've been leading Springboard to Opportunities, the open rawness in which the women share unapologetically challenging assumptions should no longer take me by surprise, but it does. I spend a lot of time listening as families dream about their futures, free of financial limitations and full of possibilities. When asked that same question, one mom said, I dream about having a garage with a car that closes so that I can be home and no one knows it. Another mom said, I just want to buy my nieces and nephew birthday presents that put huge smiles on their faces. Our moms dream about dignifying funerals, the privilege of privacy, and the thrill of being an extravagant auntie. This is wealth to them. After all of this listening, I have come to understand something. Some of us working in the economic justice space define wealth very differently than the families that we serve. We talk about financial literacy, but what does that really mean? Too often we are designing these courses around our own values and our own privileges. It's well and good to teach our moms about 529 savings accounts and even investing in the stock market. They deserve all of that. It's true. The wealth gap is criminal. More than a quarter of Black women live under the federal poverty line compared to just 12% of white women and 9% of white men. According to a 2019 Federal Reserve Survey, the median Black household holds less than 15% of the wealth of the median white household. But we can't end the racial wealth gap by using the same thinking that created it, getting Black women to imitate the sort of wealth hoarding practices that got us into this mess. This kind of thinking is not only foolish, it is inaccessible to our moms. If we don't start with their dreams as they define them, we've missed the point. Of course, I know and I understand the most basic concept of wealth is what you own minus what you owe. But for many Black women, the women that I have the privilege of working with, they do not own assets or have the ability to make a living wage because of pay inequity. That definition leaves them out of a conversation that should instead be centering them. Our moms feel this disconnect, the judgment, the scorn, and they internalize it. My passion in life, my joy is to center our moms, listen to them, and design economic interventions that start with their definitions and their dreams. In All About Love, Bell Hooks wrote, definitions are vital starting points for the imagination. What we cannot imagine cannot come into being. A good definition marks our starting point and lets us know where we want to end up. When I talk to our moms, I see a pattern emerging. They collectively define wealth as a sense of agency, a sense of freedom. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that, as it turns out, a richer definition for all of us, black or white, rich or poor, to hold in our hearts as we move through the world? What if we allow black women to define wealth for themselves, creating an entry point for which the conversation could be built over time? What if we abolish paternalism, the assumption that we know what wealth is for another person, much less should be able to dictate who is worthy of having a traditional definition of wealth. Black women have radical imaginations that you can count on. I've known it in my bones passed down from my mother and grandmother, and I've seen it in my work repeatedly. Case in point, 
In 2018, prior to cash without restrictions being a normal part of our vernacular, I launched the Magnolia Mothers Trust, providing $1,000 a month for 12 months. Magnolia Mothers Trust was the first guaranteed income project in American history that centered the needs of Black mothers into the conversation of financial equity and freedom. And what have we learned? We've learned that when given a little bit of cash, moms invest in their education, health, connection, and joy, and each other. They ask to meet together as groups and they share their triumphs, setbacks, spurring one another on to reach their dreams. Today, the Magnolia Mothers Trust is currently the longest running guaranteed income project in this country. We have supported over 220 Black mothers with an additional 200 mothers slated to be supported this year. Providing the financial capital necessary for them to dream a little bigger, breathe a little easier, and to find wealth on their own terms. And we've got a bunch of fantastic followers out there, people who are taking what it is that we've learned and listening to their communities and designing guaranteed income projects around what it is that they've heard. There are currently over 80 guaranteed income projects slated within this country. And I trace those back directly to our moms, their vision, their definitions, and their dreams. A lot of what our moms tell us they want is very simple. Enough money not to freak out if the car breaks down unexpectedly. Enough money to take a road trip to visit a relative in another state. Enough money to buy a round of drinks with their best friends. Not so like those of us in this room, right? It's my belief that we, all of us sitting in this room are made less wealthy by virtue of tolerating a country where anyone must prove themselves worthy of those conditions. So we have a poverty of imagination about what makes us truly rich. I mean, deathbed rich. I mean, the things that people say about you at your funeral. I mean, legacy. Listen to Black women, design around our vision, include us in the conversations. We may be poor in terms of assets, but we are influent in imagination. History shows this to be true. And isn't that a great starting point?